Just before we get started with the video today, if you like history videos, and you probably do because you watch this channel, then I'd like to recommend a podcast. It's called History on Fire, and you can check it out through the link below, but I'll tell you more about it in just a bit. All right, so the British Special Air Service, which you probably know as the SAS, has one of the toughest and most unforgiving selection processes of any military unit on Earth. With a washout rate of around 95%, there are only a handful of individuals who can claim to have completed this fiendishly difficult course, and only one who can claim to have done it twice once with a broken ankle. And, well, that's who we're looking at in the video today. We're looking at the story of one Donald Large. An almost mythical figure in SAS history, Donald Lofty Large was born in 1930, spending his formative years watching soldiers take part in field exercises during World War II near his childhood home in the Cotswolds. Large was pretty much set on joining the military from the moment he could shoot a gun, which, according to him, was about nine years old. His dad often took him game hunting. Serving with the Army Cadet Force in his early teens and later joining the actual army at age 15, as he matured into a man, Large's height swelled to six and a half feet. That's 1.98 meters, which earned him the nickname Lofty, which would stick with him for life. Over the next five years, Large honed his skills in Germany and Hong Kong, but became frustrated with the lack of action that he saw at the various British depots and bases that he was stationed at. This culminated in Large requesting a transfer in 1951 to the Gloucestershire Regiment for the sole purpose of fighting in the Korean War, which he nonetheless admitted he thought was a useless war. After being trained in Japan, Large saw combat in Korea, taking part in the Battle of Imjin and then defending a location that came to be known as Gloucester Hill in honor of the ferocious defense his regiment mounted during the fight. During this battle, Large was shot through the shoulder and was ultimately captured along with several other men from his regiment. Despite a bullet and plenty of shrapnel in his body and with only basic medical attention, he then survived a 10-day forced march to a POW camp near Chong Sung. During his internment at the camp, Large was shot again, endured the pain of the bullets and shrapnel, which was still embedded in his body, came down with a host of tropical diseases, and generally had a pretty rough time, as you could probably tell. He would later recount that he learned to cope with the pain by smoking the wild marijuana that grew around the camp and reading the exceptionally few letters from his future wife, Anne, a nanny that he met in 1951 while in Hong Kong, that managed to get through to him. According to Large, it was about one in five that made it to him, with Anne writing him almost every day. Large spent two years in the POW camp, going from a muscular 217 pounds, that's 98 kilograms on the six foot six inch frame, down to a mere 136 pounds, that's 62 kilograms, when he was released. This release actually happened as part of a wounded prisoner exchange program. As a result of two years of inactivity, his injured left arm was almost atrophied to the point of uselessness, and most of the rest of his muscle mass was long gone. The extent of Large's injuries were such that the army tried to discharge him on medical grounds upon his return, but Large let it be known that it was his intention to get his arm better, as well as the rest of his weakened body, and return to active service. Four years later, during which time Large had functioned variously as an instructor, a military police officer, and a quartermaster for the army, all while enduring daily excruciating pain as he slowly built up the muscle he had lost in his arm and body, Large was once again fighting fit. Almost as soon as he was declared fit to return for service, he volunteered to join the SAS. When asked why he wanted to volunteer, Large responded simply, I'm tired of all the bullshit. He had grown to resent the monotony of daily drills and military bureaucracy, and wanted to return to actual soldiering. By all accounts, Large breezed through the SAS's notoriously difficult selection course, which was specially designed to test the limits of a given volunteer's fitness and mental toughness, with his only real issue being his crippling fear of heights. Which was kind of a problem given that the regiment was called, you know, the Special Air Service. As recounted by one of Large's cohorts in the SAS, his fear of heights came to a head when he was required to learn how to parachute from a plane, and it became apparent his size was going to cause issues. You see, Large weighed almost 240 pounds, that's 108 kilograms at this time, which combined with the equipment he had to carry, meant he'd fall faster and hit the ground harder than other commandos. 
This was a problem at the time because the parachutes were specifically designed to ensure that a typically sized soldier would fall relatively fast to avoid being a slow moving target for any enemies on the ground. These primitive parachutes also had limited control, so falling fast would help ensure that the soldier wouldn't land too far away from the target zone. Another issue was that Large was so, well, large that he couldn't comfortably jump out of a plane. In fact, he nearly died early in his training when he tried to squeeze out of a plane's fuselage and became unbalanced. This led to a sort of awkward forward roll out of the aircraft. Things became dire when an equipment container attached to his legs, along with his legs, became tangled in his parachute's cords as he plummeted to the ground. Now, it's not for nothing that Large is a legend in the SAS, however. Keeping his composure while the ground rushed up at him, despite Large being more or less in an upside-down position with his parachute deployed, he managed to detach the equipment container from his leg and kick that leg free of the parachute lines. Using his now freed leg, he then kicked the tangled lines off his other leg, which resulted in his body swimming swinging around the right way up and his parachute fully deploying, reportedly very shortly before he hit the ground. Despite these setbacks, Large did complete his parachute training to a satisfactory degree, though it was noted in his records that he was not suited to parachuting, either in size or inclination. But here's where things get ridiculous. After completing what was at the time arguably the most grueling selection course of any military unit on Earth, Large crashed his motorbike, shattering his ankle and injuring his foot in the process. Thus, to prove he was still capable, he had to pass the whole thing again. Large spent four weeks recovering and ended up going through the selection process again, this time wearing an oversized boot on his injured foot to account for the bandages and the swelling. Knowing that he was able to pass the SAS's training twice, the second time while injured, it's probably no surprise that Large had no real problems serving with the unit, taking part in countless combat and reconnaissance missions across the world. During one mission, Large cemented his reputation as a man you wouldn't want to mess with by punching out a donkey because it and its owner annoyed him. This incident occurred when he was stationed in Amman helping to suppress a rebellion in 1958. Large stated of this, all the donkey handler did was laugh. The donkey's face was right by me and it shook its head and I struck a punch in among it somewhere and the donkey went down like it was shot, much to my amazement. But not as much amazement as the donkey handlers. I've never seen a bloke sober up so quick. It was a hole in one. The donkey struggled to its feet and looked really willing to go up the hill and the donkey handler lost his laugh. In a slightly more humane display, while in Indonesia during Operation Claret, Large and an SAS patrol were sneaking through the jungle looking to kill Colonel Leonardus Moradani. He was the commander of the Indonesian armed forces. However, when they finally found him passing by on a riverboat, Large called off the hit. So why did he do this? Well, there was a female civilian on the boat. He stated of this, There could have been other women and there could have been children on the boat. And we don't do that sort of target. So it went. And it was, in fact, the very man we'd been looking for for three months, Colonel Murdani of the Indonesian Paracommando Unit. And he was on the end of my rifle, and I let him go. But you can't blat women and kids. Large stayed with the SAS after retiring from active duty, training the next generation of SAS commandos before retiring in 1973 to enjoy time with his wife. For the most part, Large's final years were uneventful, at least compared to his antics as a young man, though he did notably return to the jungles of Borneo in 2003 as part of a documentary about his regiment's exploits. Large passed away at the age of 76 in 2006 after struggling with leukemia for a few years. Today, a small memorial to this larger-than-life man exists in the Allied Special Forces Memorial Grove in the form of a bench donated by his comrades in 2012. Now, just before you go today, let me make a recommendation. Daniele is a university professor, a writer, and a martial artist for good measure, and he also hosts a podcast. And if you're interested in learning more about some of the most intense moments in human history, and certainly some larger-than-life characters like you saw in this video, you should definitely check out his podcast called History on Fire. It's actually one of the most popular historical podcasts in the world. And if you like our show here on YouTube, I think you'll really enjoy his podcast. So check it out on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts or just check out some of the links in the description below. And as always, thank you for watching.